So hello and welcome. Uh, if anybody here hasn't met me before, my name is Melanie Kaur. I have been working for just under six months as uh, the community manager for Pulp and also for the Foreman project, which um, has been quite interesting. Um, today is a follow-up session to an earlier session we had this week with Brian, lead, Brian Bowders leading it um, about how we have decided as a community that we're going to move away from a contributor focus strategy in our community, which served a particular purpose in the earlier development of Pulp3 and how we can move towards a more user focused strategy. Um, I'm assuming I checked with um, a few people earlier. It, it, please let me know if you can't see my screen. And just so you know as well, is that I have added some notes to this HackMD. I'll just share the link actually it will be helpful with the group. Um, so I just share this link. I have added in in several places. Please add and modify and add your contributions, um, anything that you think of. I frame the session largely as a, I've put in content largely to promote perhaps brainstorming, perhaps opinions um, for anybody who's here to think of things that they'd like to see or think of ideas or initiatives we, we could run. But I just wanted to start off with um, the Pulp community survey it has been live for about a month now and it's closing down this week. So if you haven't, if you're watching and you haven't done it, um, you still have a few days, but just about that. So I just cherry picked some information from that survey to, to serve myself. This isn't a reflection of the entire survey, but just a few comments that I thought would be interesting for this session. Um, are, I'll just read them. So Pulp is, in the, Pulp is the only open source binary repo I see has a potential to beat every other paid binary repo out there. You have a long way to go, but I'm happy to use Pulp. So far, the team has been doing a good job with the application. I feel the workflow could be more intuitive for users. And then when I told DevOps folks that I was working on installing Pulp, they reacted very negatively. It seems that Pulp2 has a really bad reputation with those who were required to use Catello. They said that all issues with Catello were traced back to Pulp2. Some kind of campaign might be required to change the perception of Pulp3. So I suppose none of this is necessarily a surprise. A lot of this is positive, but we, yeah, we have some work to do. So the first thing on a very high level, what, and something I suppose that we can think about, and please interrupt me if, for example, interrupt me or add into this anything that you, you think that might be missing, but it's important to maybe think about what are our overall goals of a user-focused community strategy. Um, Ina, yesterday or the day before, like Grant, my, my year has been a complete blur at this stage, but Ina was mentioning, and I've read a lot as well, that when you're a small open source community that's trying to grow organically, when you're in a small phase, you need to look at how to engage and grow your user base. Um, if we were, for example, maybe a, a startup rather than, yeah, if we were a startup, for example, with a, with a proof of concept, what one approach would be to do would be to say to raise a lot of funding and then spend all that funding on marketing and then just charge for services or something like that. But our, our growth model will have to be a more organic. Um, and I suppose in order to focus on users, we need to look at the, the improving the user experience. And that's something that it has been very nice to sit through the sessions this week, because I think the entire engineering team throughout their sessions are all largely focused on this and every change that has been suggested this week I've seen has come back with the suggestion that perhaps we need to consider how big a change this will be and how big an impact this will be for the users who are upgrading the users who um, have things deployed in a certain way. So it's really, I think we, we are thinking of that. So none of this will be necessarily new information. And then yesterday and during Fabrizio's session as well, we've been 
talking about onboarding. And I think that that is, you know, that's obviously a concern if we had like a full session around it. And Brian Carney mentioned yesterday as well, like how can a user go from learning about to installing Pulp within the same hour or afternoon or day? And I suppose it's important for us to maybe think about what's what's a realistic goal around that um, and what's the best that we could achieve for a user experience around that. Um, so in terms of a user-focused strategy, I think there would, because we're small, we need to focus on our communication. I think that we have some challenges here and also the, the usability of the, of the product. Um, in terms of communication, I have just, this won't be, we've talked about some of this this week as well, and it's helped me maybe frame this, but um, the project name Pulp makes it difficult, you know, to search for or makes it difficult for us to stand out just ran to random people. Um, but at the same time, it may be, SEO is such a broad term that perhaps we shouldn't worry too much about it and just focus on targeting specific areas. Um, one concern that I in particular have is this mailing list focus method of, of communication, of announcements uh, and information sharing. It's, it's a difficult one in terms of SEO. We aren't maximizing our, our potential impact to be discoverable. Um, we had a, a user join on Monday and has suggested to us that our mailing list in particular, because it's a Red Hat mailing list, is, is very hard to discover. So I added that in as a potential concern. Um, we are active on Freenode IRC, but perhaps the Pulp channel in itself, like uh, Douglas Wibbit is, is quite active there. We have one or two people that are quite active there and that have uh, that get support, but it isn't the same as it isn't necessarily a hub of users helping other users. So perhaps, perhaps we might look at other avenues around that or adding, you know, finding our base perhaps elsewhere. One thing I have observed is our change logs can be a bit cryptic. I think I think it was for the container plugin. Was it a few weeks ago? I was writing up a release announcement, and I saw that like buried within was a was a comment that oh performance hasn't a bug. It was listed under bug fix. I think performance has improved forty percent or something like this. And if if I was a marketing manager or something like that, we should be screaming about this level of improvement, but it was very neatly tucked away in a very neat and ordered list. So I think that we could be doing perhaps a better job of celebrating some of the improvements as we as we move up uh, versions. Um, and then with COVID-19 as well, you know, it presents opportunities, but it also presents difficulties. So for example, we have people hopping in and out now to PubCon that perhaps wouldn't be here if it wasn't for an online session, but also it's difficult perhaps to talk about to talk about things that you don't like necessarily in a to to a group of strangers on a on a video call. And how can we perhaps work to increase any levels of engagement that we have lost through not being able to physically be in a room and at a conference booth talking to people. Um, and then from me as well, we have historically low levels of social media engagement. I am trying to help with that, but we're at the beginning rather than even the midway with that. So just, and then I'm going to hopefully hear more from E as as this time progresses, this session progresses. But I just wanted to. I've been bad, perhaps, with reporting status, and I've perhaps not wanted to. I've been doing things, but not necessarily wanting to be like, "Hey guys, look what I'm doing," because everything that I'm doing is to focus on growing the user base and to improve information for users and. I need the the engineering team in particular should be just allowed to focus on their work without having to to stare at all the things that I'm doing on a daily basis. But if we're going to, for example, tweet, if we're going to have higher levels of engagement, 
we need a steady cadence of, of content created. So for the first while that I have been here, I have been rewriting a lot, a lot, a lot. So I started off with the website. I started off with trying to identify some shortfalls and in information. I've I've still some to do, um, some things on my to-do list for the website, but I have been trying very much with that. I've gotten involved with some release announcements as well, just trying to improve them. Um, I've yeah, I've been trying basically as well to make our website a, re- a, a platform so a reliable and up to date source of information about pulp that pulp users can rely on, um, rather than just say having to dig dig around or go through the archive of a mailing list that everything will be listed there, and up to date with what they so that they can access what they need. Um, I've also been looking for ways that we can, you know, increase our engagement and um, reach people that might be interested in what we've doing. So what we're doing, what we've been doing. So I've been kind of developing a network of, you know, FOSS contacts uh, and blogs in which we can distribute news about releases and just um, information about Pulp in general. And I've started a digestible monthly summary of release announcements of events, of um, any kind of meetings or sessions that we've been having. And I've also started to work with getting content onto opensource.com because that's actually quite a large platform uh, for open source projects. And I think that they are going to get a bit better with other, with what they will allow published about general open source uh, projects. I heard that they will except they will provide a platform for release announcements for things like that, for example, so that that might grow. So at the, you know, at the moment, for example, if we have releases related to Ansible, we can get them published in the Ansible community newsletter for RPM. Uh, they're happy in the CentOS community to, um, to take submissions from us. Uh, Neil was talking on Monday about Fedora magazine. We haven't, I haven't looked at that yet. Um, but also Python, uh, I have contacted the the curator of that Python Weekly News, and he's very happy to take um, submissions. I've reached out to Debian community, waiting to hear back from them, and uh, continue to do this throughout all the plugins so that we can just perhaps spread the message about Pulp in that way. Um, in terms of our channels of communication, the primary ones are IRC and mailing lists. Um, I, as I mentioned, I wonder, you know, we had suggestions earlier in the week to perhaps, we don't really have necessarily a hub of, of user activity on Freenode. So I wonder, should we, should we start looking to maybe take a, you know, a period of time, like a year, something like that, where just say the pulp team moves on to matrix, we bridge into other chat rooms. We see which ones are busier than others, and then perhaps we we evaluate what direction we want to go in. And if there are if there's a bit of a split throughout, we could work over a timeline to get people onto another channel, and then we have one or two official ones, shall we say, um, at the at the end of that. Um, so I just put some. I put some questions there, um, mailing lists, for example, and I'm not sure it doesn't matter so much because I suppose because I'm not an engineer and because perhaps I fall into this desperate bracket of being on the edge of still being considered young enough to be a millennial, just about, I think. Um, I know that I've read a lot of articles that millennials do not like this mailing list approach. Um, It may not factor into our demographic, but it may do in the future. Do we do we do anything about that? Are we happy with that? I'm just posing the question. I don't necessarily have the answer. And I see from I see from interacting with pulp users that they are quite used to a mailing list culture that that I don't have. Um, And then just one last thing, or no, I have a few more things, but one thing that ties back into the quotes from earlier from the survey is that, you know, there have been several iterations of Pulp. Pulp 3 is the latest and greatest, but oftentimes I've seen it in the survey as well that some of the feedback we're getting, 
I suspect is a shift in we require a shift in perception. So some of the feedback to say about docs, some of the feedback about finding information is to do with legacy issues. While there has been a huge improvement in both the integrity and reliability of the product and scalability, everything, there's been improvements tenfold, but there's still this perception around pulp one or pulp two and we had someone mentioned earlier in the week as well, I think it was Grant, that, you know, internally to Red Hat, people took, people tried out Pulp 1 or Pulp 2, and then they're using maybe non-FOS or, or other solutions rather than Pulp. And I was just wondering, perhaps around the time, maybe when we when we go GA with the migration plugin or at some other should I suppose my question is, should we look for opportunities within and outside of Red Hat to improve the perception of pulp? Because it's a product that's been around a long time. We have to we have to also maybe do something communications wise about our our legacy. Um, so I just put some suggestions there as well. Um we're attending an open shift AMA where Dennis is going to speak about pulp at that. And um, there are just some other internal ideas there. And then I think that, yeah, the, the, when we go GA with migration plugin, whenever that happens, that might be a good opportunity to, to do some open sessions or some interviews where we might be able to just address, address the history versus everything that we have today. And this, um, the last thing on the communications is the um, basically the Ruby community, the home assistance community. Earlier in this year, they ran um, they ran like a month long session where they instead of just say filing bugs, which can be cumbersome and can take a lot of time, they just opened the floor and asked people to. You know, basically do their worst, tell us everything, every gripe that you have, everything that you you don't like, um, you know, they gather, and, and in this way, they kind of opened up this feedback, you know, they just tried to turn on the faucets and just let whatever flow flow from, from the community in order to hear what they like, what they don't like. And I was thinking about doing this in the Foreman community, and I just thought I'd put it in here for Pulp as well, because it might be of... It might be of interest to us for the very fact that we aren't going to be having one-to-one -one conversations at conferences this year, perhaps not next year. And how do we compensate for that lack of engagement, and in you know in a in a COVID-friendly way? So that's um, that was just one suggestion I put there. I am aware that I've spoken for twenty minutes without stop. <laughs> I'll stop there for now. Have you any? Questions? Any comments so far? Yes. Yippee. I always have comments. <laughs> um, from my experience at conferences, um, when talking to people who maybe they are younger, I don't know what it is, but IRC is definitely a barrier to entry. People do not want to get on IRC to ask questions. Um, Brian and I once ran a workshop, uh, where we told people to tell us answers over IRC to their, uh, problems and, uh, people are like, what's IRC? <laughs> and that's when I learned that we're doing it wrong. Um, so yes, I'm all for, uh, using matrix or whatever other avenues for getting people to communicate with us. Um, the other thought about perceptions. Um, maybe we should change our name to a project formerly known as Pulp. I don't know. <laughs> it'll be a symbol. Just, yeah, it'll be a symbol, exactly. Um, just an orange. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't know about, I think the only way to change perceptions is to uh, do exactly what you said, Melanie, and uh, 
provide as much exposure to us as possible, which means um, participating in a podcast or, pro, you know, having those articles published in various uh, publications. Uh, but really, uh, what I think would really help us is having a UI. <laughs> Um, just something that anybody can use because right now uh, it's just really hard to use pulp. And if we could have right now, uh, we have a nice video on our homepage of how to use pulp two with the CLI. Um, having something like that with a UI would, I think, uh, really change perceptions for pulp three and make it really stand out from pulp two. I'd say I deleted that video off the homepage a while ago. Um, That's okay. I've, I don't even That's know. Okay. Um, uh, we are not trying to tell people about pulp two. We're all about pulp three. We want people using pulp three. So, um, that's okay. But I did, uh, like that, uh, you could show that video to people and they could tell exactly what they could do with pulp by watching that video. And right now we can't really do that for pulp three because we need to show them the rest API and people's eyes just like glaze over whenever you show something like that. <laughs> well, we need to start with something, right? Um, I'm in favor of trying uh, different channels like metrics. Uh, the concern I have is that if we're going to have too many channels, our attention will spread thin. And I don't know how we would manage that. Um, we could possibly, as Melanie mentioned, try, uh, try metrics, like be on IRC and metrics for some time. And I don't know, or uh, other means of communication and if it looks better we can just switch um however i would avoid like going back and forth to different communication channels because i think it's already quite confusing for users to reach us if we are going to change the channels <laughs> i think they will just flip the table um yeah i also had yeah. a comment go ahead Brian. Uh, i was just saying i'm gonna go right back to you um the idea, I think, with Matrix is that just like Kieran saying in chat, we'll bridge Matrix with these channels. So there will only actually be one channel, no matter where you enter it from, um, which avoids. And I think that's a smart thing to do because we don't want to. We want to stay out of the winners and losers area around the chat wars. People are super. Is angry the word? <laughs> um, opinionated, maybe is the word. Right. Um, like passionate about. Um, thank you about um, like what's the right channel. Um, and so we can just avoid that problem like all together and just let Matrix bridge them and people can just use whatever they want to use. So in fact, what's cool about it is people who like IRC just stay on IRC. People who like Discord or Telegram use that. Um, so, uh, you know, I interrupted you. Uh, it's OK. And uh, one more remark I had about uh, Pulp 2 versus Pulp 3. I agree that Pulp 2 has some bad reputation, which uh, complicates our life nowadays. Um, and I think we did some sort of advertisement how Pulp 3 is different from Pulp 2. I didn't realize that uh, people are repelled that much by Pulp 2 and all their memory are about Pulp 2. So maybe we indeed need to make some sort give some more, even more attention on um, highlighting uh, how Pulp 3 is different from Pulp 2. And, and I have like a, even a specific example, uh, like in Pulp 2, the, the Pulp Docker plugin wasn't designed in the best way. So people who have tried to try it, they said like, it's a no way, it's a no go. Uh, now with Pulp Container, I think we're much better set. However, um, because people have like old memory about uh, things in Pulp 2. They're like, oh, I'm not going to try this because a couple of years ago it's hacked. So I don't know how to do about that and how to change uh, people's perception and opinion, but probably we indeed need to invest more time into this to 
to bring back people who tried Pulp 2 some time ago and uh, give another chance, like uh, convince them to give another chance to Pulp 3. And there was one question I had is that um, of those, just say the Red Hat open source, um, like the upstream communities that might have tried Pulp 1 or Pulp 2, can do we even know, do we know who, who they are in order to perhaps join one of their AMAs and 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 talk about Pulp 3, for example? Well, I think you have some teams and projects who tried within the company and we probably should come back to them. And this is what we're gradually doing. Uh, speaking of the community, I think it's hard to track so I, I don't have a good answer for that. If we start with uh, Neil, who talked to us on Monday, who is embedded in the Fedora community. And because I know that some of the folks, when we talk about the Red Hat community that tried Pulp and, and is actively using other things, it's not just the internal side of Red Hat. It's also all of the larger projects that are kind of, that a lot of Red Hat people are involved in. And Fedora is the, the primary one I'm thinking of. And so Mel, if we get back to Neil, Maybe he can he can point us to the various sub projects of Fedora that that would be uh, ripe for using Pulp, who maybe have decided not to because of experiences they had five years ago. Cool. No, that's and all. All that sounds wonderful. Um, maybe this is not a great idea, but I think maybe it's time to throw Pulp two under the bus a little bit from a marketing perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the feedback we're hearing is that people have a perception that it it um, it sucked. Um, just to retell what I'm hearing from the the surveys, a very negative perception. And I think in order to address that, we have to probably meet them with language that is similar. Um, instead, the language that we use now around our pulp three marketing is very much like pulp three is new and different and it can still be new and different and people can still feel really, really negatively about it. So I don't know. Um, I mean, it makes sense. Like we're all people and we have all the reflexes, including the reflex of Pavlov and the Pulp 2 has been on the market for like seven, eight years and Pulp 3 is what slightly more than a year. So it will indeed change some, uh, it will indeed take some time for people to change their habits and their thinking. So I'm not saying that we're doing anything, we're not doing anything wrong. It's just up to has been for a really long time. And we need to give some more time to pulp free and more love to pulp free. From a, from a perception perspective, would it be helpful to, um, based on the surveys where you, we've had negative impressions of the product, um, highlight those and give an indication of how those have been addressed in Pulp 3. It's not so much throwing Pulp 2 under the bus, but just taking a, an open critical view of where Pulp 2 struggled and suffered and where it's, where it's tried to be addressed in Pulp 3. Might be a nice idea, actually, for like an open an open meeting like this, where we we talk through those different points that that were brought up. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. What I was thinking in just listening to all of this is is it, it's almost like uh, if you put your marketing hat on, wanting to do a, a competitive analysis between you and your competitor, which in this case is Pulp Two versus Pulp Three. Um, where you have a list of, of points, um, Pulp 2 wasn't fast enough, for example, or it took too much disk space, or copying took forever. You know, there's a bunch of, of, of things that people have said over the years and say, this is the problem that you said you had with Pulp 2. Okay, here's how long it takes in Pulp 2, and here's how fast it is in Pulp 3. Here's how much memory it took in Pulp 2. Here's how little memory it takes in Pulp 3. And again, you're not saying, oh, Pulp 2 was terrible, but what you are saying is we listened and we have made improvements in the areas that people have told us were problems. Yeah, no, that's, that sounds good. Um, so will I continue on to the 
the next section. So this was communication, engagement, perception. And now I think perhaps we should have a discussion around the um, usability in general, which I think in a way, like I had a section in there about Pulp Installer, but I knew not to put too much time into that because I knew that Fabrizio was going to address everything and then he did, so it was great. So this, <laughs> uh, go on. Uh, I just want, wanted to mention really briefly around the the engagement element and the the technology that you use to engage. Um, one thing I've noticed working in larger organisations, security is getting more and more belligerent around what you can and can't access, largely due to fear of copy and pasting all of your source code into a, into an IRC channel. Um, not saying it's a rational fear, but it is what it is. Um, and I struggle both in my current company and my previous company to access a lot of the newer uh, methods of uh, communicating with open source people. Um, so I, I just want to want to to flag that as a as a personal concern. Well, that's great. Um, um, can you think of the like which? What is what is safe within those constraints? Uh, honestly, as as simple and old as possible. Um, the the newer ones tend to be rejected just because um, third parties haven't yet got technology in place to monitor everything that's going on. So email is fine. IRC is okay so long as you use a web client. I can't use an IRC client, for example. It has to use has to be web IRC um, to to be able when I'm when I'm in the office um, to be able to communicate via IRC. Um, yeah. That's yeah, cool. I I used to work at a different employer until 2016, and I think email was the only way that was allowed at all there. When you guys say email, does that include things like web forums or just e actual sending of email? Web form forums tend to be safe, largely because most companies will now have inline um, decryption of SSL traffic. Um, so again, it, it's all around DLP largely. Um, uh, and they're able to see what you are saying. Um, and what you're you're posting and commenting, um, so that that tends to be to be safe. Interesting. Also, I would like to add a comment regarding RC. Um, very often, people join the channels and they ask questions and they receive a void in response. So. Maybe with such experience, people actually are not really motivated to um, interact through the IRC. That that's so. From a, again, from a personal perspective, I I associate that with just the the number of people that are in there. If you go into Fedora, there there's so many more people that it doesn't matter what time zone it is, um, you're going to get um, someone responding. Whereas Pulp, I believe, is fairly dominated by US contributors. Um, so from a European time zone, and I'm, I'm guessing other ones, um, there may be silence. And you've also got the problem with IRC in that if you log out and log back in again and someone's responded to you, you're not going to get the, the response. I'm not someone that uses IRC generally. Um, the only reason why I'm using it at the moment is to interact with you guys. Um, but I could imagine a new individual, um, they're unlikely to be familiar with those nuances, if they're nuances. And that's one that's one suggestion that I was going to propose, but it's I don't know would it work. But for example, if I, I think acti personally, I believe activity breeds activity. So the more the more busy a place looks, the busier it gets. Like it's, you know, simple human psychology. I have a thing where I'm usually the first into a, a restaurant because I don't seem to suffer from that problem. So I go sit in a restaurant and then the restaurant fills up, for example, because there's somebody in there already. It's not as intimidating to, to go in there. And I think that it can be similar for these IRC 
rooms that there's nothing going on in there. So it feels a little silly to be the first one to, to post in there. So I was going to suggest that we even eliminate the pulp one and just or eliminate pulp dev and all pulp conversation takes place in one because it's not that busy. But then if it did get busy, that might be quite painful for all the different threading of, of conversations. But I do see, for example, amongst yourselves, you're often having several different conversations and just adding the person that you're speaking to. But I also think that it's not a full-time job to support pulp users and a service level at a service level of immediate. So I think it's a bit of a, I don't particularly think it's an effective way of communication, IRC in general. I find it noisy, but then again, then again, we probably can't afford to not have it. So I, I find, yeah, I find it a bit, the, the quietness of the pulp channel, I think is causing quietness, but then do we want to breed an enormous amount of noisiness? And yeah, I find that it's, it's, there's something, there's something there that I think we need to figure, figure out. Yeah, we, um, no, go ahead, Tanya. I wanted to say that that's interesting because there was a point when we said, oh, we're worried to lose uh, messages from users uh, while we are actively uh, discussing something. And we have a lot of development related conversations which they are not interested in. Let's create a separate channel. <laughs> so exactly. we, we used to have one channel, uh, but then we decided not to. Uh, <laughs> So there were there were people posting amongst you. I imagine it's like an active time, and we have a lot of discussion, and it's very easy for some user requests to get lost at this point, because they obviously they don't tag anyone, um, and uh, they just post the question, and we are like in the middle of some discussion, and it's yeah, it yeah. can. Be what I like about yep. What I like about having the user facing channel is that whenever I get online and I see that there is activity there, um, cause my client just stays signed on. Um, I go look in the channel and it's easy for me to see that Douglas had asked a question four hours earlier and I can get back to him right then. If there was a whole lot of activity, it would be really hard for me to see that there was a question like, some while ago and the key is the question from the from someone like not actively working on pulp right mm -hmm. um, exactly yeah yeah because someone... once again or yeah nudge someone uh one more time and it's not a problem but we try not to lose user requests so i i think the key there is if you're looking for if someone's if someone's looking for support and they go onto a channel, unless there are active people on the channel that can always respond to the support request, you probably don't want non-support traffic in there because that request will get lost. Um, I know for me personally, again, because of the time zone difference, I'll ask a question and I'll, it will be the next day that I log in to look for an answer. Um, and if there's been a massive amount of communication, it will be a struggle to go all the way back and, and see that information and, and see that response. If someone was able to respond within half an hour before I go home and I can work through it, then fine. Um, but till, till we had that level of support, which is unlikely, um, call me a pessimist, um, I, I wouldn't have thought we'd want other uh, more verbose communication in there yeah i mean i'm definitely looking uh, forward to a day when we have users helping users and it definitely happens now very rarely but um i remember before pulp 3 with pulp 2 we had a user kodiak firesmith who is a heavy pulp 2 user and he would be answering questions about pulp 2 in there and that was great um he and i'm hoping that we get a wide enough adoption of pulp 3 that we're going to get back 
into that where we have users uh, that are not developers helping other users. And, and I, I think that that's very possible because one of the main issues that I'm even surprised we had folks like Kodiak, to be honest, because one of the barriers to users helping users is users having an understanding about what's going on. And so many times in Pulp 2, the answer was, well, what's going on? And the answer is, I have no idea. Um, and so hopefully by having software that produces um, you know, more uh, um, repeatable outcomes and is simpler, that the user helping user um, vision will be realized. I really believe that's possible with Pulp 3. The tension that we're talking about in terms of the, the, the chat clients and the, the, the IRC, the, the classic IRC thing of there's too many people, so we split up into six different channels and now they're all dead. has been going on for years. I don't have a good answer for that. The, the real problem that I see with IRC, and I say this as someone who's used IRC since it was the new hotness a long time ago, and I'm very cynical about whatever chat client everybody wants to use this 18 month period. But the real problem that IRC has is unless you are a fairly expert IRC user and have done what you know Dennis and Brian, let's say, have done, and you've got your own bridge somewhere that's always on that you connect to, then there's these gaps. When you're not connected, you lose whatever happened. And you don't know when somebody answers you or you don't know if somebody asked a question because it never hit your client. Um, and that's a really, it's really hard to address a community when you've got those gaps. And if we had 100 people that were evenly spread around the world, there would be fewer of those, but they would still happen occasionally. If we move to something, to an approach like we've been talking about both verbally and in the chat here, of having a central matrix that bridges to our current communication channels, then that would alleviate the gap because I, I think matrix would, would be tracking the, the, would let you see the stuff that happened when you weren't actively logged into the channel. I'm, let me ask if somebody's used matrix, is that correct or am I lying? Okay, Kieran says yes. Okay, cool. Um, so one benefit of doing that, even if we changed nothing else, is we'd be able to close those I'm not currently connected holes. And if we advertise the matrix connectivity as the way to get to us, then users would also be closing those holes. And we wouldn't have to change any of our actual, you know, we were still talking in IRC, as long as it's bridged through matrix, that would help. Um, the larger, how many channels should we have discussion? I don't know what the right answer is because we are where we are today to address a problem, a real live problem that we that we wanted to solve. Um, and I don't know that I have a better answer than where we are right now. But it feels like we could get there kind of stepwise. We could we could improve the way that users interact with us in a way that doesn't leave those gaps, um, and then slowly figure out how to do things, you know, better and better as we move on and, and have an evolutionary approach as opposed to. We're just going to switch everything that we're doing to some different different thing that is the new hotness. I have um, five minutes to go through a bazillion other points that I probably won't get to, but I will. I will try to some extent. Uh, just give me a sec. I share my screen again. Can you see? Yes. Excellent. So then, so. That was just that's just a, just that's just for communication what we've talked about so far and in terms of the project itself and the project's usability we had a session today about installation so I just cut out anything that related to installation because I think I think it's it's known it's obvious and I suppose that there will be some action items that we will take to simplify the user experience there um, I will just use the next four minutes maybe to talk about documentation. And I think like I've been working in documentation since I got out of college and enterprise level documentation, API documentation. I look at your docs and I think that you've put a lot of work into your docs. I think that as developers of a project, they're fairly well documented. You know, there's a lot of conceptual information in there. Um, from the survey, 
yet 58.8% of users reported finding it difficult to find information about Pulp. You have to factor into that that some of these users are Pulp 2 users, and I do suspect that from their comments that some of them may not have looked at Pulp 3 docs. I don't I don't have a great familiarity with Pulp 2 docs, if, if I'm honest. But I think that, again, we have to weigh this a little bit with perception rather than the current state of affairs. So, and look for, I took this uh, from just one comment to illustrate these points, but, um, you know, the Pulp 1 version docs are still available, but totally different from Pulp 2 docs, no response from mailing lists, lack of real world examples, unhelpful error messages. I'm not really sure from this, just say which, yeah, well, actually I can check that. If I go back, I can check whether they have used Pulp 3 or Pulp 2. And um, so if I write up a proper summary of the, the survey results, I'll be able to dig into that a bit deeper. But in terms of error messages, because I'm not using the product necessarily, I'm not aware of the error messages, but that's definitely an area that I can 100% help with. I used to write <laughs> too many of them when I worked in IBM because IBM was incredibly focused on reducing its support costs and actionable error messages that help the user get out of the situation that they got into to throw the error is something that has been proven to um, liberate users from having to go and seek help and allow a certain level of independence. So if anyone is writing error messages or anyone wants me to review error messages, I'm very happy to, to do that. And earlier in the week, we kind of talked about this issue of real world examples. So our workflows, for example, show you how to set up some some how to order the APIs in order to match the, the the specific low level workflow of the plugin. But in terms of real world examples, how I'm curious how we will go about understanding what problems, what are the the, the higher level problems that people are solving in the community with Pulp and how we can then how we can then serve them in our docs, even even on a high level, even just to, to give context. I think that that's something that might be quite useful. Um, I This comment about documentation sometimes is difficult to find for the required plugin. There's an active effort you know, to consolidate that. So I think that this is something, it's been reported when we have occasional audits or annual audits. That's something that was brought up several times as well, but it is, it's in, progress now so we can largely strike that off. Um, someone wrote for me, it was hard to get started with the shell script and HTTP IE stuff could be easier for newbies. Um, API talks are too vague in places. String does not tell me where there if there are character restrictions. So yeah. Um, and then just one thing I suppose I added in I added in about topic based writing as you were speaking in the previous, as Mike was speaking in the previous section um, about man pages. Um, but how do we measure whether our docs are serving the users? So if there's incorrect information, users will raise an issue. But for example, with Red Hat documentation, like with the enterprise level Red Hat documentation, they have this plugin that they have implemented where a user can literally, well, since I left, um, since I left satellite, they've disabled it because it's it's it causes a lot of work. But basically, you can highlight the text, right click, and leave a comment saying, "No, this is wrong. This is unclear." And there's a lot of we were getting a lot of really useful feedback through this. And I was wondering, should we, for example, create a Google form that we could put into the doc? So there's something that's not an error, but something a general user engagement opportunity was did did you get to where you wanted to go to with these docs? What has, you know, what worked, what didn't work and who, leave it maybe permanently linked in there for someone to just give us feedback that's not necessarily something that needs to be put into a sprint, but something that might help us shape how we do docs. And then in terms of what you were talking about in the earlier session with the installation, how, so, most large enterprise level documentation um, 
efforts that I know of. So I've worked for, th you know, three large American companies at this stage. I have friends that I graduated with that are working in other companies like SAP and um, places like this. And there's this, there's a general approach to documentation where you, it's almost like object oriented programming. You have, you, you have separate files and per file you create, you know, an action based item. Um, then in another file, you would have your conceptual information defined, and then you would have references like tables, um, indexes, things like this that's useful for advanced users who already are maybe configured and keep going back. If that's something you're interested in, we can talk about that at another time. Um, yeah, so these points I've kind of addressed. I think the documentation is sound from someone who has looked at a lot of documentation, too much documentation for a lifetime maybe. I think the documentation is sound, but perhaps we might need to we might we might need to just shift our, our thinking or add more context or perhaps look at look at how we can get more users to give us feedback on that and um oh i'm over time i see now um i have just i'm going to end really really fast but basically from the survey um all pub 2 users they expressed a the desire to have pub 3 cli 50 percent of pub 2 users cited it as a blocker 44 percent of pub 3 users cited no cli uh, cli sorry as uh, setting um as a difficulty to using pub 3 and 70% of the users asked on the survey said that they did not need a web UI, which is a little bit controversial, but I just said I'd throw it in there. And that's all from me, I think. That's cool. I have a quick question. Do you, did you get a feel for like, um, for, so CLI versus web UI, did you get a feel for like um, whether Pulp 2 was motiv motivating that perception that we need a, a CLI in Pulp 3 or not? Um, all. Pulp 2 users reported that they needed a CLI. Not all, less than half of Pulp 3 users reported that they needed a CLI. So I suppose that that might that might answer the question. Yeah. Okay. So and I imagine, so like for the web UI, did the Pulp 2 users say that they didn't need one, I guess? I, I'm going to dig into that. Um, so that 70% of all users said that they they didn't need a web UI, but I'm, I'm going to write up, once it's actually closed, I'm going to write up a proper report on this, and I'll dig, I'll dig into that exact question, David. OK, cool. Because, yeah, I'm, I'm working on both of those, so I'm just kind of curious, I guess. Yeah, and one of the questions I have as well about the UI statistic, um, perhaps because I have the belief that Pulp absolutely does need a web UI, is that um, we're pulling users who are pulp users. So these users have already accepted the complexity of pulp. And what we can't know, or I don't know how to assess is what would the question answer be if we asked every user who considered using pulp? Because I actually believe that we're turning away perhaps even a majority of users. And that number could be like 90% of users want a web UI um, because of how, because of the demographics of the segment of the user population that we're actually receiving responses from. Yeah. So the software that would compete with Artifactory and Nexus both have UIs, and I believe those users would say that they want a UI. Exactly. And also, as we talk about growing the community and how do we get to the naive user in the first place, a UI makes that a lot easier. And just to, I want to, I want to talk address Douglas, who specifically said, "I really need the REST API. I don't care about the UI or the CLI." The idea here is building on top of that existing foundation, not replacing that foundation. Um, that everything at the end of the day is going to focus into the same code that's issuing the same commands. It's just how do we make it more accessible? But this is the classic survey problem of you're only going to get responses from people that are motivated to give you responses. And you're not going to get the people who looked at your thing and said, yeah, screw that. I'm, I'm never going to use Pulp. They're not going to respond to the survey either. I'm very aware of yeah. I first of all I agree with you completely. I'm just um, I just wanted to just throw spanners, I suppose, as as one does at the very end. Um, I'm aware Tanya's session. You only have a few minutes to have a bit of a break. If you want to follow up on Brian, I'm not sure if this was what you were 
hoping for what the but yeah if you want to follow up on anything we can i suppose um, and we should probably end yes let's end the recording this was absolutely wonderful um really really great uh let's click it i'm gonna quit the thing here um yeah i just want to mention on friday there was a session for both the ui and the cli